Hello and welcome to this talk for the Norwich Society of Historians. It covers two topics. The first is using existing maps in historical research with an emphasis on online sources. The second is creating maps yourself to illustrate your research findings, in particular using open data and free software. I'll give examples I've produced in this way for the Norwich Society and the Thorpe Hamlet History Group. There are notes to accompany the talk available on the historians page of the Norwich Society website. We normally think of a map as a straight aerial view, but as some early maps show, something more akin to a panorama was quite common then. And panoramas are still in vogue, as this 1940s example by John Murray Smith of Norwich shows. It was recently saved and restored by the Norwich Society and can be seen in the Maytoad Hotel, but you probably wouldn't think of it as a map. Other early maps of Norwich range from Cunningham's map of 1558 through to Hochstetter's of 1789. But never assume with a map that it was based on an original survey and thus accurately reflected the situation on the ground at the time of publication. These two maps, published more than 20 years apart, look remarkably similar in appearance. And that raises the question, how original was the later one? Ordnance Survey Maps and the National Library of Scotland digitised versions provide information about survey and publication dates. In this example, publication was in 1886, but the surveys were carried out between 1880 and 83. It means that anything built in 1884 or 1885, for example, before the map was published, wouldn't be shown. The most comprehensive source of old Ordnance Survey maps online is the National Library of Scotland website, and those most likely to be of use to historians are from the 1 inch to the mile map in increasing detail down to the 25 inch to the mile. Even more detailed maps were produced by the Ordnance Survey in the late 19th century at a scale of 1 to 500 and Norwich Heritage Projects has them available online. Ordnance survey maps are not the only maps that may be of use to historians. Some maps were produced specially for particular purposes. This is an example of a map prepared in connection with the enclosure of common land. This one is quite different, prepared in 1892 as part of a temperance campaign. Norwich was reckoned to have a church for every week of the year and a pub for every day. Later, I'll talk about preparing a 2020 version of the drink map for part of Norwich. Uh, this one is a map prepared under the Tithe Commutation Act of 1836. These maps predate detailed Ordnance Survey maps and so can provide useful information about an area in addition to the purpose for which they were prepared. Specially produced maps are still produced, for example, for road schemes or planning applications. Today, they normally use the base of an Ordnance Survey map, and that's been the case for a long time. Now, this example is of a map prepared under the Finance Act of 1910, which created the increment value duty tax on land. The huge task was undertaken surveying and valuing properties, and even if the tax itself was not a success, those records are today a valuable resource for historians. Maps such as these, and tithe and enclosure plans, have to be read in conjunction with other documents, such as the Finance Act field books, or enclosure awards, or tithe apportionments. More recently, in World War II, the Norwich City Engineer produced maps using an Ordnance Survey base to record the location of air raid shelters and wardens posts, and also where bombs were dropped. Moving on now to the second part of the talk, 
You've done your research. You might wish to use a map to illustrate the findings. How can you do this? Open data is now available from Ordnance Survey in particular, but also from other sources. You're paying for it as taxpayers, so you might as well use it. It's free to use, but you have to acknowledge the source. So all the maps I'm showing have a base that's Crown Copyright and Database Right 2020. Data comes in two forms, raster and vector. Uh, raster is easy to understand and use. It's an image, the same as if you take a photo or scan a document, and it can be manipulated in the same way. For example, by cropping or adding arrows or text boxes. It's what I used when I started using open data because vector data sounded rather daunting. This map of small green spaces in Norwich city centre was produced by cropping a raster map converting to grayscale, and then adding the marker dots using desktop publishing. What you can't do with raster mapping is change the underlying map, and that's where vector data comes in. So it comes as data rather than an image, and you then use software to draw the map from the data. It's more complicated, but potentially much more powerful. And the data comes as a series of layers and you can choose which to use, add your own layers to show your research findings, and you can also share layers with others. So for the Thorpe Hamlet History Group's publication on Thorpe Hamlet and the Second World War, I took information from the city engineers plans I showed you earlier and added them to Ordnance Survey base maps to produce these maps showing where the shelters and wardens posts were in Thorpe Hamlet and where the bombs fell. Using vector data allows you to be selective in what you show. Here are two maps drawn from the same collection of data, in one case a fairly standard map, in the other just showing the contours and watercourses, and that might be potentially useful if you wanted to show the nature of the land where settlement took place. Digital mapping has also been used by others to redraw historic maps. And here's an extract from the very fascinating British Historic Towns Trust's redrawing of the 1789 map of Norwich. And another local example is Andrew McNair's digitization of Faden's map and his digital recreation. I showed earlier the 1892 drink map of Norwich. It featured in a talk by Elizabeth Warren to the Norwich Society historians, and that set me thinking about what a modern day equivalent would look like. There may be fewer pubs now, but in 1892, you didn't have supermarkets and corner shops stocked with bottles of wine and cans of lager. For the Thorpe Hamlet History Group's publication on Thorpe Hamlet and the First World War, we researched the pubs that were open then, and that was my starting point. I already had a map record for those pubs. I added a column to the attribute table to record that they existed in World War I, and another to record whether they also existed in 2020. I then added extra locations where you can buy alcohol now, such as supermarkets. I then generated a map showing the places where you could buy alcohol in World War I. The concentration that you see on the northwest side was due to the proximity of two barracks. And then another map showing where you can buy alcohol today, either in pubs and bars or in shops. I haven't included places where you can have a drink, but only with a meal. And copies of both maps are in the notes. The attribute table that I showed you is essentially a database. So to show what's possible in terms of manipulation, here's a map that shows instead just the places where you can get a drink today 
and you could have got one in World War I. I've also shown how you can add labels. That concludes my talk. To find out more about the Norwich Society and how to support our work, visit our website or follow us on social media. The Norwich Society Historians Facebook group enables like-minded people to share their interest in Norwich history.